Um, Jared is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at the University of Alabama. His book, The Cactus Hunters, Desire and Extinction in the Illicit Succulent Trade, was published by the University of Minnesota in 2023. He was named a 2024 National Geographic Explorer for his new research exploring illicit harvesting and trade in the Venus flytrap in North Carolina. Now, you can see behind Jared, there's a nice little um, collection of succulents, and I'm sure a lot of us have that in our homes. Um, if you have questions, and I'm sure a lot of you might, please put them in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom toolbar. This is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel. Jared has also very kindly given us a discount code for his book, should you want to purchase it during or after the talk. So keep a lookout on our chat box where I will be posting small links about the book and a little bit about our YouTube channel, et cetera. And that's it from me. Um, thank you, Jared, and over to you. Thank you so much, Padma. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a, a privilege and an honor to be here. and. Um, if at any point you're having issues hearing me or anything like that, um, Padma, if you just want to, you know, um, let me know, feel free to interrupt me. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about my my new book today, The Cactus Hunters, Desire and Extinction and the Illicit Succulent Trade. Um, and I'm going to kind of weave in and out of some of the kind of big picture ideas of the book, but also kind of focus in on a few particular examples that I think do a nice job of trying to illustrate how it is as a social scientist and a self and a political ecologist. And, and a geographer, um, it is that I, I came to be um, focused on the study of uh, illegal and illicit trade in in, in cactus and succulent plants, um, and in why it was that I decided to kind of really focus in on desire as a central analytic for this research, which was um, really new for me as a as a scholar. Um, and, and because it is the Linnaean Society, um, uh, I, I did feel obliged to start by just gesturing, of course, towards both the importance of Linnaean taxonomy to this project, which I write a fair bit about in the book, um, but also um, the work um, Linnaeus himself did uh, with the cactus family. Um, at the time that um, Species Plantarum was, was, was published, um, the um, Cactaceae family did not yet exist. Um, uh, Linnaeus described cacti as uh, one of two genera. Uh, there was two genus of cacti, um, the cactus genus, and then the Pereschia genus. Um, the, the image that you see here is of a species that Linnaeus described as cactus melocactus. Um, melocactus today is a genus and cactus itself is no longer a genus at all. Eventually this species, um, came to be renamed in the 1990s by Nigel Taylor, who's a contemporary, uh, kind of cactophile and, and expert of, of cacti, um, for Linnaeus as melocactus Carolee Linnae. Um, uh, the species is near threatened on the IUCN red list, which uh, within the world of cacti, as we will shortly learn, is actually pretty good. Um, and this is what the species uh, looks like where it grows in Jamaica. Um, it's relatively abundant. And what I find really special about uh, looking at this image is, while I've never been to Jamaica, I've spent a lot of time with mellow cacti, uh, mostly in Brazil, and they, they live in, in very similar landscapes of so this kind of pockmark uh, limestone landscape. Um, but I also think it's interesting to start with this point about the, the shuffling of names of cacti, because I think the practice of species naming begins to point us in the direction of these very distinctly human desires and how desires get mapped onto other forms of life and shape our um, ways of knowing them, um, and in turn how that process of knowing them shapes our conservation interventions on their behalf. It's worth noting in this context then that um, while there are 1,200 to 1,500 species of cacti uh, today, depending on how you count, there are over are recorded um, over 12,500 names of cacti that have been recorded throughout history. Um, and this again tells us a little bit, or begins to tell us a little bit about those distinctly human desires to name new species and novel species, and how often that occurs very much within groups of plants that are of particular interest to humans. So cacti are one of the most studied groups of plants on the planet. Um, similarly, we find that within the family of orchids, for instance, um, where there are tens of thousands of species of orchids, whereas in other families of plants that are maybe less studied, Maybe plants that um, eventually in time will become known as multiple species are still known as, say, one. Um, 
And that might just be a question about paying attention. Um, so to begin, why um, why did I write this book, and and why and why should I care, or we should should we care about the illegal wildlife trade in cactus plants? It's important to know in this context that cacti are actually one of the most threatened taxonomic groups of any species assessed um, of animals or plants globally. And when I say assessed here, I'm specifically referring to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's um, Red List, which many people will be familiar with. Um, almost a third of uh, the 1500 um, species of cacti that have been assessed are classified in the Red List as threatened. This again is um, one of the most threatened taxonomic groups of plants or animals on the planet. And of those threatened cacti, the majority are used for horticultural purposes which are extracted from wild populations. So their horticultural uses are oftentimes linked to wild growing plants rather than cultivated plants. Um, these plants that are threatened um, are found across um, uh, the Americas. Um, there are no old world um, cacti, um, although they grow there now today due to translocation. Um, not so true for succulents. Um, but um, within the context of cacti, there are hotspots found across the Americas, ranging from Brazil to Uruguay, to, to Mexico, to Chile, to some of the um, Caribbean islands. Um, but importantly, one of the primary biological resource uses of threatened cacti is their collection for horticultural trade, um, much of which is illegal, which brings us to this topic today, which is to say that there are many threatened cacti in the world, and many of those threatened species are threatened by um, horticultural trade by people who desire to possess them as ornamental plants. Um, when I started this work, I had never heard about illegal cactus and succulent trade, and I had come across an article about saguaro rustling or saguaro poaching in um, uh, Arizona, and I was intrigued um, as a form of illegal wildlife trade I'd never heard of. Um, but within a short period of time, as I was doing this research, um, it seems that there was a growing amount of attention to illegal trade in cactus and succulent plants around the world. Um, this is an example of an article that was published on the front page of the New York Times Science section a few years ago related to a series of a, a large poaching incident involving um, Copiapoa cacti um, that ended up in, in Italy. But there are many other examples. Um, Today, there is a really serious problem of illegal succulent harvesting in South Africa, in Southern Africa, as well as East, Eastern Africa. Um, I'm currently doing some research with colleagues in South Africa um, and also in South Korea related to this, this problem. I was in South Africa this past summer and it's, it was really devastating to see just how, how, how much pressure these plants are under, again, for horticultural trade. Um, but it, the research also uh, led me to um, uh, my own backyard uh, in the US, uh, where a few years ago, um, a major new um, problem emerged with the legal trade in um, the succulent Dudleya farinosa, as well as Dudleya pacophytum um, from Mexico. And so uh, this suddenly became a topic that was, um, you know, uh, being written about in major newspapers around the world. Um, it grabbed, it, you know, it grabbed the attention of the public writ large, I would say. And part of that is because these are extremely charismatic plants, but they're also plants that lots of us have in our own homes, like the ones behind me um, uh, today. And so this was an interesting moment in which my research was occurring at a time when a lot of attention was uh, also um, being placed on this in, on this topic. And, and so this also kind of gives some background context for why we maybe should be concerned about, about you know, this new form of or not to say new, but this form of illegal wildlife trade. Um, and so this is all really interesting to me as a, um, a political ecologist and a geographer and a social scientist, but it sort of left me wondering, other than the sort of who, what, where, when, why questions, what was the kind of intellectual gap that I, I could potentially fill as a, as a social researcher? I'm not a, a botanist. I'm not someone who's an expert on cacti. Why was it that I was going to come to obsessively spend the next five to six years of my life with um, cactus, uh, cactus lovers and out in the field looking at cacti? Um, was this a question about simply greed and political economy? Um, in supply and demand? And if so, was that really an, uh, a set of interesting questions? 
And, and the short answer is no, in that um, ultimately this research led me down a very different towards a very different body of scholarship in, in a, a research path than one I had gone down before. Um, my past work um, in my PhD was on human wildlife conflicts in South India, and kind of looking at how um, conflicts between rural agrarian communities and the state manifested and played out in human wildlife relations and relationships uh, with tigers and elephants and leopards. Um, and so to start, I want to give you just a small example of how it is that a social scientist like myself becomes enraptured in a research project like this about succulents and cacti um, and how the study of cactus um, and cacti through illegal wildlife trade um, uh, becomes a, a, a rather social endeavor. And so I want to start with this plant. Um, I, I can't see who's here today, but maybe ask, you know, this may be a cactus that's pretty familiar to some of you, and maybe some folks who are listening in even have one of these on their windowsill. Um, this is a cactus that's called oftentimes a moon cactus or a lollipop cactus. It's worth noting that today the largest cultivated production of them, and they're only cultivated, which will make sense in a little bit, um, uh, is in South Korea. Uh, they were originally developed as a cultivated species or a kind of cactus in the 1980s in Japan. Um, but what is it? Um, we could argue that in terms of uh, cactus success in the world, it's one of the most successful cacti on the planet if we were to measure that in biomass. But as I'm going to show you, it's not even actually a cactus species. And in saying that, I think we can see how cacti have a, a lot that they can teach us about ourselves and human desires. And so to do that, I'll start with this man, Alberto Wojciech Fritsch. Um, he was a very, very famous uh, Czechoslovak cactus um, um, uh, aficionado and an amateur botanist and natural historian, uh, but also an amateur ethnologist and ethnographer. Um, as a young boy, he got a cactus living in Prague um, and quickly became obsessed with cacti. Um, quickly making a name for himself um, uh, in in the late um, in the late 1800s uh, in Prague as an extremely skilled young man and boy growing these plants at a time when they were really prized as these very exotic and strange species. Unfortunately, his cactus collection, which had grown into the thousands already um, before he was even 18, died um, one winter and a very cold frost. And it's this death of his plants that set him out to decide he needed to go to South America to see these cacti in their native habitats. Um, while he originally goes to South America because of his love for cacti, he soon um, pivots and begins to study um, the rapidly disappearing indigenous cultures of the people of Southern Brazil and Uruguay and Paraguay um, at the hands of German um, colonialism and, and genocide against its indigenous peoples. Um, later in life, he will come back to study cacti again, but he he's off he's more known um, in academic circles today for his role in idiosyncratic role in relationship to journal, German colonialism and um, as an early um, ethnographer than he is for his botany work. And the reality is as much as he loved cacti, he was actually um, not the best botanist when it came to neat descriptions and in detailed descriptions of plants. But the example I'll turn to here is a species of plant today known as Gymnocalisium mionovici. I. Um, it comes from um, Paraguay in northeastern Argentina, and it was first discovered by Fritsch in 1903. It's a really lovely um, example of a Gymnocalisium, um, which is a cactus species that I now very much um, like. Um, but this plant was named for Nicholas Mionovich, a Yugoslavian shipowner who paid for um, part, who helped pay for Fritsch's excursion to botanize. And in part, it was because this was someone who um, was very passionate about cacti. And so Fritsch would then collect cacti and sell them on um, to collectors in, in Europe. Um, one of the interesting traits about this plant is it often um, would have natural mutations in which it would develop an absence of chlorophyll. This is an example of Gymnocalisium minovici variety nishiki that was developed in Japan in the 1980s. And certain collectors much later in the 20th century would come to really enjoy um, coaxing and playing with different cacti to bring out these kinds of mutations, where since for this plant, it doesn't produce chlorophyll at all. And so in putting um, Gymnocalisium minovici um, into our kind of collective, co collective consciousness, I want to put a pin in it and, and then introduce 
yet another cactus, but one that maybe probably everyone here is familiar with but didn't even realize was a cactus. And this is the dragon fruit, um, which maybe um, you, um, you, know, you can find in your local supermarket. Um, the dragon fruit is actually the fruit of a cactus. Um, while today much of it is grown as a cultivated agricultural crop in Southeast Asia, originally the species comes from, um, from South America, where, for instance, it um, produces these absolutely gorgeous blooms, this Selenocereus monocanthus. But unlike how we often imagine cacti to be growing in the arid desert lands of, say, the Sonora Desert or in the arid lands of Mexico, this is a cactus that's all lush in limbs and grows as an epiphyte in subtropical forests um, and uh, grows quite differently than we see it as the dragon fruit as a cultivated specimen. specimen. Why do I bring up these two cacti? Well, to return to the moon cactus, the moon cactus is actually the grafted um, sort of monstrous combination of both of these cacti together. The dragon fruit cactus, the Selenocereus, is used as the quickly growing rootstock to support the life of mutated Gymnocleisium mianovici, which can't survive on their own because they no longer produce chlorophyll. So this cactus that so many of us are familiar with is actually not a cactus at all, but the grafting together of two different cacti, one which relies on the other, and come from very different geographies in, in South America. And so I like this example because I think it shows us something about how social of a creature these cacti can become, and also how cacti themselves can teach us a lot about ourselves and human desires. And so in my book, I talk about it as a book which is a study of plant people, or what we can say is a dedication to that hyphen that connects the person and the plant to one another. And I love this, um, I love this epigraph um, from, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the TV show, the British TV show, The Detectorist. I could have included a real quote from one of my interlocutors, but, but this one is so good and so well captures this sense. Um, where Lance, one of the characters from The Detectorists, which is a show about people who go out metal detectoring, writes, he says in a scene, I had a friend once, he had a cactus, the same cactus sitting on his windowsill for 15 years. Then one day someone gave him a second cactus and within six months he had to move to a bigger house with enough space for his collection. And what I like about this quote in thinking about the dedication to the hyphen of plant people, as many of my kind of research participants describe themselves, is this idea of the fantasy that these plants have power over us as, as social creatures. And of course, a cactus can't have true power over human desires, but we can imagine that to be the case. And it can have real material consequences, both for environmental change, but the plants themselves in the world. So here you see the image um, on this slide is a, a really beautiful collection of cacti from a private collection in, in, in the Czech Republic or Czechia. And you can see there those mellow cacti again um, on the table that it's a mellow cactus azureus. It's a really be beautiful bluish plant with that gorgeous red and white cephalium, which is the part on the top. Um, and, and so I start there because I really think of this book as focused on that connectivity between um, people and plants. Originally, the title for my book, um, which um, is now The Cactus Hunters, I originally suggested to the publishers that we title it The Succulent Subject, and they were probably right to change the name. But the reason I like the idea of The Succulent Subject is it, we're able to play with the question of who is the subject in the context of the succulent subject? Is it the plants themselves or the people who desire these plants? And so in the book, what I lean into is this um, the effective and emotional and political and what I would call more than human relations that emerge between people and plants as the mo primary subject of inquiry in the book. Um, and the term more than human, which is used often in geography to talk about more than human geographies, is not just an expression to say all the things that in the, are in the world that are not uh, or exceed humanity, but rather it's an expression to convey that that which constitutes the human exceeds it. So we have always been, I would argue, more than human creatures, and it's through our relationships with other species that that becomes cultivated. Oops. Oops. So just to quickly go sort of through the research by the numbers, what did I do for you know, several years in studying this project? Um, I conducted over 100 interviews with conservationists and botanists, cactus collectors, law enforcement agents, and other relevant stakeholders 
I reviewed hundreds of pages of court records and cases related to illegal plant trade. Um, um, and I conducted multiple weeks of in-depth participatory observation on cacto exploration trips. Um, I engaged in participation and engagement with dozens of cactus club meetings, conventions, and events. Um, and I also joined the British Cactus and Succulent Society um, as a member of the Sheffield branch of the, the British Cactus and Succulent Society, because that's where I was doing this research as a postdoc at the University of Sheffield. Um, in the end, I conducted research in um, seven countries um, uh, across four continents, which tells us something about how global in scope this, um, not just this research, but this, this issue of illegal trade is. Sorry, and I'm just realizing that um, I'm just checking. I just switched my mic because the, the power on my other microphone just went out. So um, please interrupt me if you can't hear me anymore. Um, no, it's fine, Jared. Great. I'll keep going then. Sorry about that. Um, and then um, to kind of beef up the quantitative side of this research, because this was really qualitative research, um, which was relevant and I think important. Um, I did conduct an online survey with research colleagues at the University of Oxford and University College London with about 500 cactus and succulent collectors, um, primarily in the US and Europe, but also abroad and further abroad. And we have plans to do a more global survey as well. And the research results of that more quantitative work were published in the journal Conservation Biology um, in 2023. So where did this work take me? Well, it took me to places like this, private, um, collections of, of plants with cactus collectors who are really passionate about them and these plants. Um, one of the things I really loved in this research was spending time with these really expert growers and collectors and lovers of these plants to try to understand what it was that connected them uh, to these plants and what made these plants so desirous for them. Because at the end of the day, even if it, I can see it now as a very naive question, the question that I set out doing this work on was to understand how is it that people who seemingly love these plants the most might also at times be engaged in activities um, that are leading towards their demise in the living world, which is to say, how is it that people maybe were beginning to love these plants to death? That's not to suggest that a lot of my interlocutors were engaged in illegal trade. Um, most of the collectors I spent time with were not, but it was really important for me to understand the cultures of collecting plants as a route into understanding um, the the uh, these illegal aspects. Why is it that people would be engaged in illegal trade um, for these species that they cared so much about? So I conducted a lot of interviews and spent a lot of time with collectors in their greenhouses, watching them engage with their plants, but also asking them questions as a kind of embodied research practice. I also went out into the world in habitat um, uh, with these plants, um, usually in the company of um, so-called cacto explorers or cactus lovers. Um, this wasn't to watch them engage in illegal activity, although that's not to suggest that at times that might not have happened. Um, although I was never engaged in um, participatory observation work with people taking wild plants out of habitat. Um, not so true for seeds, but that's more, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it also meant engaging in practices that they themselves participated in. And one of the most common activities for, for lovers of cacti who, who go out into the world to look at these plants is to engage in, in photography. Um, so much like we've seen the sort of transition away from, say, um, trophy hunting and sport hunting towards, say, wildlife photography is a common practice for people to go and enjoy looking at, um, you know, and say, endangered megafauna in the world. Um, you also have um, a lot of cactus collectors who like to go out and take pictures of plants. And so one of the things I engaged in as well was some of these practices as well. So um, um, although I didn't have the sort of... Um, extremely expensive DSLR that a lot of these collectors have with really big lenses. I did enjoy learning about, for instance, the practice of macro scale photography, learning to take pictures of plants up close as a way of developing and cultivating more meaningful relationships with these plants. It also meant, for instance, attending cactus and succulent society meetings, going to collector shows where they show off their plants and also engage in social activities with one another. Um, and so one of the things I learned through this work is as much as the cacti or, or succulents were at the center of these communities, it was often the social bonds between collectors that was really important for a lot of them. But it also meant engaging in what um, geographer Teal Valde has called investigative ethnography, which is the idea of combining and blending, for instance, um, the work of traditional investigative journalism or fact finding 
um, with the work of more kind of critical and nuanced attention to thick description that we find in the practice of ethnography or writing about particular cultures. Here, the example being the sort of culture of um, cactus and succulent collecting cultures. Um, so very much a mixed methods kind of approach to research, you know, um, heavily drawing on qualitative research and ethnography and participant observation, but also blending in, for instance, um, more quantitative survey work um, in this kind of investigative ethnographic work as well, as well as really trying to learn my botany. I didn't wasn't familiar with with cacti um, very much before beginning this work, and it was important to me, especially to be able to build trust and relationships with my participants to be able to speak about about these plants. And and so, of course, unsurprisingly, as a result, I am myself also now um, someone who who loves cacti and succulents and collects them as well. Um, so um, this is the sort of outline of, of the book structure that results. It tacks back and forth between research conducted in the US and in the UK and in Europe. Um, it then goes um, in chapter two to Brazil where I engaged in participatory observation with Cacto explorers um, going out into different parts of Bahia and Minas Gerais looking at cacti. Um, it tacks back to Europe in the strange story of how it and why it was that the Czech Republic or Czechia um, becomes one of the epicenters of illicit succulent trade. Um, it goes back to Brazil to contend with questions about anxiety and extinction. And then the last third of the book really focuses on the emergence of this new illegal trade in deadly succulents from California and Mexico that really emerged in the middle of doing this research when um, uh, a number of botanists reached out to me and told me that this was happening and that I should pay attention to it. I ended up leaving Mexico to go to California to do this work. Um, and eventually it would take me back to Mexico, but also to South Korea in, in an effort to really follow these plants. And so following these plants in their sort of global circulations as part of the research was really important. And then the book ends with the sort of meditation on what it might mean to try to enact what I call a more flourishing geography for succulent life. How can we enact more kind of cultivated um, relationships with cacti that, that lean into forms of more than human care and caring for these plants in ways that doesn't threaten their, ex their um, existence in the world? It's important here to sort of pivot and take a moment to actually explain what does it mean to talk about illegal trade in cacti? And what is it that makes a cactus illegal per se? And the short answer is absolutely nothing makes a cactus illegal. Um, with the small exception around, for instance, in the US, peyote being classed as a class one drug, um, similar to heroin. But um, there's nothing that makes a cactus illegal otherwise, um, like this Aricarpus retusis that you see imaged here with a beautiful flower. Um, the illegality that I'm talking about in this book focuses on the compliance with international and national trade regulation. Okay, so the book's focus on illegality and illicitness is about what happens when these plants start to move in the world. So I'm gonna explain in a second what CITES is. Um, for those who aren't familiar, it's a trade convention that regulates the international trade in endangered species. So including cacti, there are over 3000 species of succulents listed to one of the three CITES appendices. Um, and with a few exceptions, the entire cactus family is listed on one of the appendices of CITES. Um, it's worth noting here that where cacti are a taxonomic family, cactaceae, the term succulent is not a taxonomic family. There's no such thing as a sort of family succulenta. Um, succulents is a term that um, helps us describe the physiological traits of a kind of plant that's able to restore water in its body or root system in order to maintain metabolism in the absence of water in the soil. So there's many, many more succulents and they're found across the tree of life. There's about 12,000 plants that are considered succulents. So CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And it's the CITES convention that makes it possible to talk about the existence of something like international illegal wildlife trade in cacti. CITES is a relatively old convention. It was um, came into effect in 1975. Um, and there are over 38,000 or close to 40,000 species currently listed on CITES, um, most of which are plants, uh, not animals, which surprises some people. Most of those plants are orchids also, um, because there are a lot of species of orchids. And we could potentially argue that there's a lot of species of orchids because 
collectors are really obsessed with them. So there are different appendices on CITES. Appendix two is an appendix that means that um, uh, for a plant to be traded internationally, the, there needs to be a country export permit. Um, so the trade is permitted, but regulated. Appendix one essentially bans all importation and export exportation of these plants, largely speaking, except for scientific purposes. There's a third appendix called Appendix three, but we don't need to get into it, I think, today, and it's a bit complex. Um, but it's essentially an appendix where um, countries can request the assistance of other countries and kind of paying attention to the trade in the species. The entire cactus family is either listed on appendix one or appendix two. So either uh, their trade is completely regulated and requires export permits um, to trade internationally, or the trade is essentially um, essentially banned. There are exceptions to this though, namely for artificially propagated plants. And that's a really important exception, but it comes with some complications that arise as well. This is what it looks like to go on the CITES website and look at the appendices. So here we see the cactus family being listed. The entire cactus family is listed on an appendix two, as you can see here. And then there are certain particular species and sometimes genera, um, like the entire disco cactus genus is listed on appendix one. It's important to note that CITES is an international agreement between governments and its aim is to ensure that international trade in the specimen and species of, of wild animals and plants doesn't threaten their survival in the wild. This is another way of saying that CITES is a trade convention, not a conservation convention. And I think that sometimes is something that's missed in discussions about what CITES is and what is its role and what is its job in relationship to species conservation. How does this come to matter? Well, here's a great example. Um, if you, I just went on eBay and pulled a couple of screenshots of some plants that look extremely suspect to me um, and are trying to dodge issues of CITES. So CITES applies when plants are being traded internationally, okay? Uh, this became especially important in the context of Brexit in the UK um, because the UK used to be part of the EU. Um, um, it was, um, it didn't require export, CITES permits to import or export plants from, from the UK to Europe. Um, that is no longer the case, and it's caused a lot of grief for a lot of British cactus and succulent collectors. But here's an example of a species being listed on eBay called Ariocarpus confusus. This is not a real species. Um, I think that they use the species name confusus in order to poke fun at the fact that what they're actually selling is a different species that they're trying to avoid being caught by regulators. Um, this is a plant that looks like it's lived a little in a harsh world, right? It's being sold for several hundred dollars. It's advertised as growing on its own roots, which is oftentimes a way of saying it's not a grafted plant. And the person who is advertising it, in addition to being based in, in Ukraine, um, uh, this is a, a species of cactus that grows largely in, um, in Mexico, but also in the United States, um, makes a note of saying that they do not provide any kind of export permits and that they are not responsible if the plant is confiscated by, by, um, by local um, customs agents, right? So this is a clear example in my mind of a, probably a wild harvested plant um, that is being traded illegally on the internet um, if it was sold internationally. Um, um, a few other examples I just pulled last night, just to give you some more examples of, again, plants that um, really don't look like cultivated specimens that are selling for a lot of money. Um, and again, where the seller is very clear that they do not provide to international clients export paperwork, but they're very happy to sell the plant to them all the same, right? So more or less happening out in the open. This is not a black market. This is not happening on the dark web. Uh, this is an issue of a lack of regulation um, um, that happens out in the open because, frankly speaking, compared to a lot of other forms of illegal trade, illegal wildlife trade in cacti is not um, really high on a lot of people's lists. So this leads me to just asking some big questions, some basic questions about early on in this research about who steals a cactus and, and why is an important question. And also how, understanding a desire to understand the actual supply chains of how do these plants move in the world. And so to get at doing this research, I really wanted to spend time with people who are passionate about these plants, but also the plants themselves. And so, for instance, the reason that I started this work on Dudley Farinosa in California, but eventually made my way to Mexico and eventually to South, South Korea, 
was because I wanted to quite literally try to follow these plants in their global circulations through illicit economies and illicit networks to better understand them. One of the ways I was privileged in this research, and I hope that it extends and can speak to other forms of illegal wildlife trade is because there's so little attention paid to this form of illegal wildlife trade, it was quite easy um, to find people willing to talk to me about it um, and, and uh, to follow these plants in their sort of global circulations in a way that didn't risk sort of my own security or safety or that of my research participants. So a little bit about some of the geography and demographics um, coming out of this research and my results. One of the things that became very clear very quickly is that illegal cactus, cactus trade is global in scope. Um, when we include where the plants are coming from and where they end up, it is really all over the world, um, but especially um, in the global north. So my book focuses especially on the US, Europe, and East Asia as hotspots of demand. But in particular, I really focused in on the US and Europe because there's an enormous bias in the wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade literature, focusing on, and right now, especially East Asia as a, a, a hotspot of demand for illegal wildlife trade products that completely ignores the fact that the, U, that the US and Europe are two of the largest epicenters of consumer demand for illegal wildlife trade products. And I know that, for instance, um, Professor Rosalie Duffy spoke to the Linnaean Society last year about some of those dynamics as well. And so I similarly take a critical edge in my work in trying to draw some attention to these um, uneven dynamics about where is this trade happening and where are we not paying attention to it. Um, so there's this critical focus actually in my research away from East Asia as the only recognized demand center for illegal wildlife trade. Um, in the US and Europe, my research shows both qualitatively and quantitatively that cactus collectors tend most often to be white older men. That is not to suggest that there are not women involved in cactus collecting or other um, you know, um, uh, ethnicities or, or, or people of different races uh, that collect plants, but especially when we hone in on illicit and illegal trade, this very much came to the fore as a particular kind of demographic that I was focused in on. What's also interesting to notice the gender components of this research. So I ended up having to do a lot of reading in gender studies for this research as well, because unbeknownst to me, um, today more men um, collect only cacti compared to um, women who are more likely to collect only succulents. Um, there are people who collect both, of course, but in those categories of people who only collect cacti, they're more likely to be men. This is to suggest that certain kinds of collector trades can be gendered. Um, this is not a novel finding, but another reproduction of it. Um, but this isn't to suggest that plant collection is, is fixed in its gendered forms. Um, historically, in fact, this was otherwise. And so in the early 1900s, for instance, cacti were also extremely popular to collect, but mostly by women rather than men. So these relationships between gender and collection and, and, um, and um, interest in gender for different kinds of species and wildlife, um, uh, they can be gendered, but it's not to say that they're fixed or sort of uh, natural in any way. They're extremely social. Um, this cactus community is also um, really formally well-educated, relatively speaking. Um, and so what I want to do now is kind of shift to a good example of, of, um, of how it was that I started to think with desire in particular as a, a central analytic in this research, rather than only thinking about, say, issues of supply and demand and economy. And so here you have this collector, a British cactus collector, who, who said to me, most of us will be quite happy with a cultured or grafted plant, but there will always be those who want the real thing. So I want to give an example of what this can look like in practice. Um, so this is a plant called Mammillaria bertholdii. It was um, first formally described um, in 2013. So it's a relatively new species of cactus that was described. And it caused an absolute sensation within the cactus collecting community after first being described um, um, by the German Thomas Linzen um, in 2013. Um, it was first quote unquote discovered by the German um, self-described cacto explorer, Andreas Berthold. This is a really unusual looking plant. And for a lot of us, we may not even be able to recognize it as a cactus. It has these feathery pectinate leaves. It grows really flat against the ground. And then it has this stunning magenta flower, which is probably when it was first found in habitat. And it grows in an extremely restricted range in the uplands of rural Oaxaca. What's especially fascinating about this plant is that despite its status as completely new to science in 2013, seeds in small grafted stock, what you're looking at here is a grafted plant, it's growing on a faster rootstock, 
were almost immediately for sale online and at major cactus conventions in Europe at the same time that it was published and desc described in 2013. So it's therefore certain that certain individuals, plants and seeds were smuggled illegally out of Mexico years before the species was ever described in the scientific literature. Um, several years ago, grafted specimens of these plants were purportedly sold for over $1,000 or more. Um, and the first seeds were made available for around $50 per packet of 10 seeds from the Czech Republic. According to scientists and amateur botanists, the greatest threat the species now faces is from poaching for the international illegal trade. Describing the plant in 2014, Thomas Lindzen said, undoubtedly we, meaning cactus collectors, are the biggest threat to the species at the site and all cactus enthusiasts. It is the urge, the craving to possess everything that is new and still has the appearance of the unusual. So here we can see even in the first description of the plant in a, in a, in a publication of describing the new species, this acknowledgement that the greatest threat the species faces is the result of human or cactus collector desires um, in relationship to the possession and desire for the plant. Here's an example of what the plant looks like in the hands of a Czech cactus grower. So what's really interesting about the story of Mammillaria bertholdii, in addition to the fact that it was already available legally, illegally for sale the minute it was first described, is that within a matter of years, the price for this cactus fell to just five to $25 for grafted plants. And any of you could find it online quite easily, even though all of that trade is essentially illegal because Mexico has never given export permits for the species. The people who first stole the plant out of Mexico told me one day as I toured yet another world-class um, collection of cacti in the Czech Republic, that they were responsible for this rapid price crash. And that by providing um, cultivated plants and seed for the market, they were averting a rush of collectors seeking out this wild growing plant in Oaxaca. This is to say, they, they, and they, and they said, if not for us, this plant might already be extinct in the wild and yet we are made out as the criminals. Um, but all of this took place illegally in much to the consternation of Mexican authorities. And so here I wanna frame something that was really important that emerged in this research, especially spending time with, for instance, um, cactus collectors and alternatively cactus smugglers in the Czech Republic was this idea that I draw out and play with, especially in chapter three of my book, is this idea of the um, archetype of the Robin Hood conservationist, right? So this idea that the people made out as conservation villains in this story who were engaged in illegal activity unambiguously, see themselves as, um, as acting sort of uh, against the law, but above it in, in a sort of moral higher authority, right? Saying that if it wasn't for them, this plant would be extinct in the wild because collectors would have invariably gone out into the world to steal it. Um, so that by quote unquote flooding the market, even if it was illegal, right? Um, that they were averting um, a sort of a extinction crisis. And then therefore they should be seen as the conservationists in the story. So I would describe the modus operandi of the Robin Hood conservationist as saying that the law and trade regulations of CITES governing the trading cacti are wrong. And so answering to this moral higher authority, moral higher authority is justified as an act of species care. That caring for the species is a means of ensuring that the plant can circulate globally and that causing some level of harm or taking some plants and some seeds from the wild, even illegally, is justified in order to circulate the material, which is another way of saying that the ends justify the means. We can say then that flooding the market with propagated plant material crashes the market for more expensive wild harvested plants. That's the sort of idea of the, the, um, the, the collector here. And so we can sit with this idea that this is a sort of seen as a really pragmatic response, even if it's taking place on the wrong side of the law. And so one of the most fascinating things for me in this research, therefore, was that the people who were being made out as the conservation villains in the story by conservationists and law enforcement officials saw themselves actually as sort of subversive conservation heroes, even if um, they were not recognized as such by conservation authorities. I'm not suggesting I necessarily agree with that perspective, but it was one I needed to take really seriously as part of this social research with, within this community. That's a really pragmatic response and justification just through one small example that I actually only write about in the preface to my book about how this story of illegal trade becomes complicated quite quickly in terms of who's doing conservation work in the world. But I also wanna give a moment for really thinking with desire as well and how desire served as an analytic in my research. 
And so as much as it surprised, it surprised me as much as probably anyone, um, but, but, but psychoanalytic theory ended up becoming really important for me in trying to make sense of how these kinds of illicit trades demanded paying attention to things beyond basic supply and demand laws and issues of economy to thinking about what was motivating individual actors out in the world. Because a lot of these people who are engaging in illegal activity aren't necessarily getting rich doing so. So there's something else at work here. And my argument is that in part, it's unconscious processes in the desi in desire that is. And so especially the work of um, French psychoanalytic theorist Jacques Lacan, especially in form of my work. And these are just a couple of important terms and ideas that I play with in the book and that helped me to sort of analyze my research findings in a more, um, I think in more powerful ways. And ultimately I came away from this project firmly convinced that psychoanalysis has an extremely strong explanatory power, even if it was one that was very distinctly different than the kinds of forms of analysis and theory that I'm used to working with. So, um, you know, one of these, the, the, the most important one are, arguably is just the basic idea of what desire is, which I describe here as this sort of insatiable horizon composed through the fantasy of an imagined other. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying that um, desire is the sort of force that motivates us to live in the world, always seeking, always seeking out in the world through this imagined fantasy of this thing that we see as lacking within our very sense of being. Another key idea is this idea that um, is really important in Lacanian psychoanalysis, and that's the idea of jouissance. Jouissance is just um, a sort of idea of this intellectual pleasure tinged with pain. So as much as we might enjoy certain kinds of things, that sometimes that enjoyment comes with a certain degree of pain. I saw that taking place, for instance, in the desire of collectors to seek out um, visiting and viewing um, plants threatened with extinction in the world. So as much as there was an enjoyment in seeing these plants out in the world, um, it was always marked by this kind of pain of recognition that those plants were disappearing from the world. Um, extimacy is another one. This is the idea that um, the, the, um, our sense of unconscious interior self is also enjoined with the exterior world. This is another way of saying um, that the unconscious is also very geographic, that the ways that we understand and express the unconscious in the world is through our engagements in the world. And so that my way in route into studying the unconscious processes motivating collectors in the world was through paying attention to how they moved in the world in relationship to these plants. The last term that I, um, I engaged with quite a bit was this idea of anxiety, um, which is different than how we oftentimes think about anxiety, um, but is an idea of a kind of portending dread, a signal of unconscious distress. So um, I, uh, Lacan writes that anxiety is the one signal that does not deceive. And so here the idea is that anxiety can be actually a really important signal of unconscious trouble brewing beneath. And I write about this in the context of contending with watching extinction unfold in conservation landscapes. Um, one of the things that this, this led me to thinking a lot about is what makes particular plants desirable? Is there something innate about particular species or particular plants that draws out um, collector desires? And ultimately what I come to show in the, in the book and write about in the book is that we have to understand that desire is an extraordinarily social process. And as much as we imagine that those desires are attached in a fixed way to particular species, it's what we map onto those species that motivates and generates a lot of that desire. A good brief example of this would be in uh, that I described in my, my book in chapter two was the experience of looking for the cactus Ubulmania buningii. It's a particular species of Ubulmania that grows in, um, in, uh, in, in Brazil. Um, and this is the landscape in which we understood it was to be found. This was a known um, location for the plant where just a few years before, one of the members of the group I was with had seen hundreds of these plants growing in the landscape. And yet after hours and hours of searching, we could not find a single plant. And the reason being that it had been over collected um, for illegal wildlife trade. And just before we left that location, I was lucky enough to find um, the plant. And um, this is a picture of me looking a little bit younger and brighter before COVID. Looking at this very small plant, you can see it in the bottom center of the, of the screen, um, very small little cactus. Um, and yet we had spent hours looking for the species that became so imbued with these um, emotional and effective significations of loss and lack that I actually that I actually was almost brought to tears in finding the plant. It became this really joyous moment of, of encounter with these other collectors. 
And so I write about sort of the awe and enchantment that comes in looking for these plants. But if I hadn't encountered the species with those collectors who knew so much about it, but also that sense of loss of what it should have looked like, that there should have been this flourishing geography of this plant throughout the landscape, it wouldn't have had those effective significations and um, desires mapped onto it. And so the desires I came to feel myself in writing this book for these plants, which I knew nothing about before beginning this research, can't be understood outside of the social context in which I encountered the species um, with these collectors who cared so much about it. Um, before leaving the site, as just another example, um, uh, one of the collectors I was, was with said, the strange psychology of collectors in this hobby is that some people would now say, okay, this is the last one. And it was was the last one and we should take it home to protect it. Plenty of people would say that. And I'm happy to report that the people I was with were not gonna do that, that we left the plant where we found it. But there was something really striking in that idea, right? That in through the act of possession that the collectors themselves saw it possible to save the plant. So what saving means for collectors versus conservationists can mean very different things, but in them, I saw a very similar dynamics. And so one of the arguments I try to draw out in the book is that there's actually a whole lot more that connects conservationist desires and urges to possess through preservation that connects the desire to possess of the collector to put the plant in the greenhouse. A great way to express this comes from the work of criminologists um, Mackenzie and Yates, Donna Yates, who says, on the surface, the argument is that to acquire the, the, the object of desire here, practice, saves them from destruction. There is, however, another type of saving. The collector saves the objects from obscurity. Yet even if they did not need the collector to save them from potential destruction, there is a strong sense in the collecting narrative that they deserve to be appreciated. They deserve to be um, loved. And in this sense, the, off the collector offers salvation. And I really love that quote because I think it tells us a little bit about what it means to desire and what it means to possess and collect. Um, I encountered all kinds of um, um, muddy and complex places in this research that muddied the waters between the strictly illegal and the illicit. A great example of that, for instance, was the collecting of seeds by collectors. So it's worth noting that beginning in 1997, um, the country of Mexico upgraded all cactus seeds from Mexico to CITES as well. This means that even to, tr to trade internationally in Mexican cactus seeds, you need a CITES permit. And this was something that a lot of collectors saw as really frustrating because they see seeds as a really important way of trading in the genetic material of plants that doesn't harm them in the wild. Now, other Mexican conservationists would argue that actually recruitment rate for these species in the wild is quite low. And so even the taking of seeds can harm them in their, um, in their reproductive rates. But I did, for instance, see collectors oftentimes in habitat refusing ethically to take wild plants but nevertheless collecting seeds as a way of being able to share that material with other people in the world. Um, and so these were just a couple of vignettes and stories and moments from the book that I hope to try to draw out to show and share with all of you why it was that I felt like I had to move beyond just sort of thinking about um, the basic machinations of illegal wildlife trade and economy and really sit with desire as a key analytic for trying to understand this really fascinating and strange world of illegal wildlife trade in cactus and succulent plants. And so I just want to leave you with a couple of concluding um, thoughts from some of this work, you know, which has now, um, you know, been six years or so in the making and it hasn't really ended for me. I'm now um, a member of the, um, the cactus and succulent um, specialist group of the IUCN Species Survival Commission. I'm continuing to do work on illicit succulent trade in South Africa. I'm now doing work on illicit, uh, illicit Venus flytrap trade in North Carolina. But um, in terms of a few conclusions, I just wanted to share that, you know, attention to desire, I would argue, offers insights into what can appear as contradictory behaviors within the ornamental plant com collecting community. So how is it that um, collectors justify behaviors that from the outside might seem as, as really clearly wrong, right? And, and how do they make sense of those behaviors? I also want to make the claim that prohibition as an impulse to save species may not necessarily lead towards the most effective conservation outcomes. And so my opinions about um, you know, trade regulations and also about um, prohibition really changed through doing some of this research and that there might be opportunities to think more pragmatically about how we might cultivate our relations with these plants with care. 
and how that might actually encourage exchange and in, in, in trade in these species in sustainable ethical ways that also should benefit economically the communities that live is live with these plants and have lived with them historically and, and, and stewarded them historically. Um, I, I wanna make the argument also that an analysis of desire for non-human life demands attention to broader structures, economic and unconscious that undermine species flourishing. So it wasn't enough to only pay attention to economic issues, but also things going on in, this, in the realm of the unconscious that were kind of motivating people's behaviors, whether they all were aware of it or not. And finally, that what it means to care for species can mean a wide array of things and involve a wide array of practices with different kinds of political consequences and consequences for environmental change in the world. And that what care means really depends on who you are and what that, um, what that signifies for you in the world. And so I think I've gone just a little bit over time and so with that, I just want to give a couple of acknowledgments just to share that this work would have been completely impossible without the support of the Biosec project, which was an ERC, European Research Council funded project um, led by Rosalind Duffy at the University of Sheffield um, and, and for some support from my college at the University of Alabama. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks, Jared. That was absolutely wonderful. And I must say you have set the bar. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Uh, you set the bar high for the rest of the program for the year. Um, there are so many different threads to untangle here. Um, just a few things is I, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall on the Cactus Club meetings, but I guess you have done that for us uh, because often these subcultures are, you know, emblems of what we want, but from a safe space. So it's kind of always interesting to see that. Um, you have the slide about, I mean, I'll just, start with a question that I have uh, with customs and botany. And I remember, and I think I saw Jocelyn Bose in the, I don't know if she's still there um, in the audience. She did a talk for us on law and botany and how the criminaliz criminalization of cannabis and persecution led to um, different strands in research. So that was quite interesting. Um, I have just one question is that does the current biodiversity crisis um, make this desire more intense, which you kind of answered um, in in that beautiful picture, moving picture of that man sitting in, you know, the Brazilian landscape. Because when in one of the quotes, there was also the word salvation. And, you know, they kind of, it kind of moves from, like, there's a power dynamic here where they want, where the cactus is, has a higher, you know, a, a, is more powerful when you want to collect it. But you kind of change it in the savior mode, which is kind of moves them into a spiritual realm. I mean, did uh, what was the, your thoughts on this? Yeah, there's uh, there's so much. That's such an important question. There's so much embedded in that question, and I tackle it in a few different try to kind of ways in the book. There's a real, you know, and I think in, in part of what I try to do in the book is be critical about the conservation community as well, right? In the sense that there's also a desire for salvation in the act of preservation, right? The imagined idea that um, humans haven't lived with these species, you know, before, or that the only way to, you know, sort of conserve these species is through kind of hardcore fortress conservation models that that reject the idea that humans have that can embrace and engage in in, in, in cultivated relations with these plants. Um, but there was a lot of this idea also of salvation for the collector. I have a, a moment in I think chapter six of the book where I write, for instance, about a, a really well known uh, collector. Um, in, in botanist um, who writes this kind of biblical Victorian description of encountering this new species never seen before, never discovered in what he describes as a virgin landscape. And, and, and I do that in part because what's fascinating about it is it reads like something out of a Victorian explorer novel or journal, right? And yet it was written in the 1980s about a place that the man writing it knew that people had inhabited for over 10,000 years and unambiguously was not a novel species to the community who lives there, right? It was simply a new species for him and for say the, the Western scientific community, um, but by no means an untrammeled, untouched landscape. It was a working landscape with a copper mine a hundred feet below it, right? And so he's able to mentally ignore that history yeah. in his mind in order to cultivate this idea that he's there as, you know, sort of a salvation figure, right? 
for this plant. I mean, it's no surprise perhaps that he was also a working priest at the time. Um, but so, but this idea then of possession and salvation is really important. Um, and I think it's something that, that I wanted to pay attention to and how it was that different people sought out the plant. The argument that my publisher made for calling the book The Cactus Hunters is not because the idea of hunting is only restricted to the collectors going out in the world and illegally taking plants, but how so many of us, myself included, were involved in forms of hunting through this research, right? Whether that was the conservationists or the law enforcement officials or the collectors or myself, we were all out in the world motivated by our desires, search, searching for something. And, I, and, and so I thought that that was actually a, a nice decision that the, that the press made in terms of the, the title of the book. I must say that you should uh, congratulate your publishers for changing the name because this is a much better title, I think. But you're right. I mean, when, you know, when we show in our collections, when we show people our, our specimen drawers of butterflies, uh, there are two kind of emotional responses is that one is, wow, that's amazing. And the other is, I can't believe you collected them. You know, I can't believe that these were killed and collected. So, I mean, both are valid in their own way. There's too many questions, um, which I expected, but um, I'm going to try my best uh, and not tire you out, Jared. Um, I'm just going to go sequentially. Uh, what is the difference between the CITES red list and the red list that you mentioned earlier? Um, yeah, so um, apologies for that clarification. There's no such thing as a CITES red list. Um, the only red list is the IUCN red list of endangered species. Um, uh, CITES is, is a separate trade convention. That's again, only that regulatory convention. Um, the relationship between them is that CITES focuses on endangered species. And so red listing, um, the red listing of plants is information that's taken up in discussions about what species to list on what appendices in CITES. Right. Um, okay. Um, are pollinators are uh, yeah. <laughs> if anything jumps out at you, um, feel free to grab it. I'm also uh, very happy to share my email if people want to get sure. email with me. Yeah, I mean, I think this is definitely something that everybody is uh, quite interested in. Um, are any pollinators at risk um when with this kind of illegality? Yeah, you know, that's an important question, and it's not an important question because I can answer it. Because one of the things that struck me leaving this research as someone who's not a botanist is despite how studied the cactus family is, what is not studied is their ecology and the ecological relations that they keep. I was quite stunned in doing this research about how little we still know about these plants and their relationships with other non-human life in the world. Um, it makes me very sad that botany programs uh, around the world are declining. And I think that, um, but it also signals that a lot of the collector attention and focus on these plants is on the plants themselves as objects, but objects that are living, um, but without necessarily attention to their ecological relations in the world. Unambiguously, the removal of these plants from landscapes is going to affect pollinators. But I can't tell you how, because there's extremely little research on them. Maybe there's a lot of PhDs in there just saying this um, to everyone who's here. Um, well, there's a collector here uh, who says that's one of the best talks he's heard. And do you envisage your work and research impacting the legislation of trading of plant material, which is every researcher's dream, I guess? Yeah, um, you know, I've been really happy to say that, you know, so I'm a member through this research. I am I'm now. Um, uh, a member, like I said, of the Cactus and Succulent Species Survival Commission for the IUCN. I'm their first social scientist, which I think is great. Um, I'm also now a member of IUCN's Sustainable Use and Livelihoods um, uh, program. I'm also now, they have a new plant use group that I'm a member of. And I'm actually now a member of a new illegal succulent trade task force that was recently started by some folks at Kew, among others. So I absolutely hope that this research can inform policy. I think that CITES, without, I'm going to go on a limb here and I might get in trouble for this later. CITES is a really well intentioned convention and I think it's an important convention. We need to remember, and I'm not the only person who said this, that it was written in 1975 before the internet. And there are unambiguously issues that have arisen in how plants are able to rapidly move around the world, in part through the emergence of electronic trade exchange that it is very hard for CITES to grapple with. And I think that a lot of people who work on CITES are aware of this fact, that there are things about the convention that probably need pretty major reforming. Yeah. Um, 
This is an interesting question. Would it be possible to work with collectors to reinforce or reintroduce natural populations, as in the case of mammalaria, which I guess some of them are trying to do, maybe? Yeah. So um, this is also kind of something I hope I'm able to come out of this work doing is um, there's a lot of frustration with the, within the succulent and cactus collector community that they feel marginalized and sidelined, I think, by the professional botanical and conservation professional community. And one of the, the alternative example I would give, and this is maybe a bit too simplistic, is, you know, you think about the relationship between um, um, ornithologists, professional ornithology, and citizen scientists and birders in the birder community, and how important, for instance, amateur birders are to the production of knowledge and, and science about bird populations around the world. And it seems to me that there's a real missed opportunity here. And actually, in the survey work that I did, one of the biggest things that came out of that work is that even though illegal activity does persist within these communities, um, there was an unambiguous sense that the collector community would like to be more deeply involved in conservation work and to be taken seriously in terms of the kinds of knowledge that they have. Most conservationists and botanists do not have time every year to go out and look at these species populations of hundreds or thousands of different species, but collectors do, right? And so I think with the right kinds of training and engagement, there could be ways that this community could be mobilized to help do good conservation work. Um, but by and large, I would say that a lot of that isn't happening, but I would say it's improved. I, I do think that there's hope on the horizon that that could improve. Yeah, maybe, I mean, you know, the difference between it's surviving in my house versus it's surviving in the wild, you know, there's a, I guess they could think of it as a purist argument, you know, what, I mean, what is the ultimate aim of whether it is to survive or whether it is to survive in the wild only. But I think that is kind of subtracting the ecological purpose or the ecological question completely. It's not, it's not something that it's by itself. It's surviving in an ecosystem. Yeah, I write a little bit about in situ versus ex situ conservation, right? So think about zoos, right? So there's a moment in the book where a collector says to me, I, you know, I sort of see my collection as a zoo for plants. And I and I and I critically look at that. Like how seriously can we take the idea that keeping these plants in collections could be seen as doing conservation work, right? Yeah. But it was in that question I realized, um, are there any examples of where, you know, species have been reintroduced? And uh yes, like a good example, I think um in Mexico, Echeveria laui. Um, and, and Lowy actually is the, the guy I mentioned who sort of sees the virgin landscape. So these people loom large in, in our social histories of these plants. But Echeveria Lowy is a really a stunning succulent from Mexico that was over harvested um, and illegally harvested um, and has now been reintroduced through conservation propagation programs. There's now a park protected area for it and things like that. Um, so there is there are possibilities to reintroduce species. Um, yeah. Um, I guess you answered it in a way, but are there any incentives that can be given to locals to stop illegal collection of succulents? Um, and this person refers to South Africa's Western and Northern Cape provinces for export to China. Um, so CITES is obviously not, not the right tool. Yeah, so um, I'm actually, I'm waiting on a grant response, uh, a, a grant review right now um, with colleagues in South Africa and South Korea to do work just on that question. Um, the I had never... I, broadly speaking, in my research, um, which was focused on kind of the excesses of economy, so why is it that these plants always end up in, say, global north countries? It's because people have ex have money to consume, right? Um, what I was seeing in South Africa when I went this summer was extremely eye-opening because it looks a lot more like the dynamics we've seen play out in, say, rhino, horn poaching, or elephant um, um, ivory poaching related to poverty, right? Right. Um, these are plants that suddenly became extremely desirous in the world and they're, be, they're growing in places where there's extraordinary poverty. Um, those remote areas of say Namakwa land in South Africa are extremely poor um, with very few economic opportunities. The response to this should not be in my opinion, prohibition and criminalization, but a focus on sustainable use and economic development. That is going to take work, but it also means doing work that isn't just being run by conservationists, but by people who actually understand how do you build, you know, say new, um, you know, uh, economic um, businesses, right? The people who know how to grow these plants the best are oftentimes in other countries. And we need to think about how can we put some of those resources into supporting local communities in these habitats to grow these plants themselves and be willing to pay more for them as a result, right? We are, we're dealing with like several hundred years of colonialism here as well, right? In terms of who has power and advantage and who can grow these plants well, right? The Netherlands remains one of the most important places in the world for the growth of these plants. Um, and that's not just 
it's a coincidence, right? Um, so there's work to be done on on those on that social front. Yeah. Um, just a few questions, Jared, and I'll let you go, I promise. Um, no, it's fine. It's great. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks. That's really kind. Um, there are a couple of questions that are quite interesting is how does the hype spread in the subculture of the, you know, the cactus community? Like somebody says, you know, this is a hot item. I mean, I'm also interested in this. Or yeah. I mean, how does it become uh, so desirable? Yeah, I mean, so on the one hand, in kind of classic ge human geography terms, there's the neighborhood effect where simply it's, you know, word of mouth and things like that. But what has rapidly ramped that up and ratcheted it up, which will be no surprise to I think everyone here, um, is the rise of social media and in the internet, right? So the ability with which um, new material can be visually transmitted and shared online unambiguously has um, escalated how quickly that desire and demand moves, but also shifts from one species or, or genera to another. It's extremely fast and mobile. And that's also making it really hard, I think, for conservation programs and law enforcement officials to respond, right? One of the things that was really fascinating in their work on Dudley Farinosa in California is by the time that the California law enforcement officials were even aware that the plant was being kind of um, illegally harvested en masse from the California coast, the plant's popularity in South Korea and elsewhere was already in decline, right? And, and was starting to move on to other things, right? So that's how fast these things can move. And that makes it really, really hard to respond, right? Um, which is not a, 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 a a warming or welcoming thought, right? It makes the it makes the work more challenging. Yeah. So was this, I mean, the decline in demand, is this correlated with, you know, grafted populations? Like that was one of your points, is that, you know, you're basically leading to a crash in uh, demand. Yeah. One of the things that's really hard, I mean, and so from a qualitative perspective, I would say yes. So based on my interviews, so I spent a lot of time interviewing commercial greenhouse growers and collectors in South Korea, um, and, and what led to that price crash basically was there was enough time to grow the plants cultivated in South Korea to meet the demand, but they're slow growing plants. So one of the things I say in the beginning of the book is that the lutability of cactus and succulent plants has evolved. And what I in part mean by that is not only are these a lot of times plants that can survive international transit in a cardboard box for three weeks because of their succulents, their ability to survive without water, unlike a lot of other plants. Their slow growing nature means that they're more uh, likely to be impacted by these illegal trades because of how long it can take to get that new material out in the world, right? So one of the things that makes, say, an Areocarpus cactus extremely desirable is that they're so slow growing, right? So a cactus this big, you know, can take 40, 50 years to get that big. And so some collectors don't want to grow it from seed because they're going to be dead long before the plant is able to produce a flower, right? And so these disjunctures between the temporalities of humanity and these plants is part of what I think makes them um, vulnerable in these in these contexts. But yeah, the price crashes in Korea were largely because supply was beginning to meet demand and then desires move on to other things because also, as we know, right, oftentimes the thing that's harder to get intensifies and amplifies those desires to possess it. Yeah, yeah it's so sad that um, its feature for survival is now actually leading to it not surviving, um, which is it's it can survive in bizarre conditions. And also nobody thought of this evolutionary pressure, I guess, is, you know, transport on ships. Um, somebody, uh, so Vesta asks, why does most of the trade appear to come from Czechia? Or is that just yeah. some of the examples that you used? Yeah, so it's not only Czechia, but I, I do have a chapter in the book because this was something I had, was not on my radar screen at, at all. Um, you know, part of it was a paying attention to history and social history. So especially the, the sort of important role of this, this one figure, Alberto Wojtek Fritsch, but also sort of um, sort of Czech desires to sort of leave their own um, imprint on the South American landscape. But it, it's a really wild, it, I'm trying to think about how to summarize it quickly. Um, it has to do with Soviet era communism and sort of occupation and the inability of Czech cactus growers to get new material as a result of the Iron Curtain. Which only sought to, which only sort of served to amplify their desires, both to see these plants in habitat, but also to acquire new material. But the result of being unable to get that new material resulted in Czech growers becoming some of the most skilled cactus and succulent propagators and growers on the planet. Um, and so my time in Czechia was spent with these extraordinarily skilled growers, um, 
we're sort of forced to learn how to become some of the world's greatest germinators of cactus seeds and propagators. Um, and so by the time of the sort of collapse of, of the Soviet Union, there was this built up desire to see these plants in habitat that sort of was unleashed on the world. Um, and, and so the story, the story in chapter three kind of weaves through that history, but also brings in literary sources as well about kind of Czech, um, Czech relationships to authority and law. And, and so it's not only the Czechs, um, but, but, but I found it a particularly um, important story to sort of think about, again, the sort of the role of the unconscious in, in shaping these histories, because certainly it's not a uh, there's no, there's nothing natural about why, say, the Czech Republic would become the epicenter of illicit succulent trade. And so That's, paying attention yeah. to that history became quite interesting. I also want to give a shout out. Um, yeah. Someone, uh, Jeff Ullerton, has left a, a good reference point around pollination yeah. notes that actually there is quite a bit of information about that. And so that's um, that's helpful to see and know. Um, my, yeah. my, my response was coming from oftentimes asking that question of botanists as well, and them sort of oftentimes shrugging their shoulders about particular species and say like, you know, is this pollinated by an ant or, you know, a flying insect and, you know, oftentimes people not knowing. Yeah. No, thanks, Jeff. Um, okay. Jocelyn says she was here. Um, is there an interest in communities of cactus and succulent fans in creating a system to certify, you know, like wood is certified or paper certified? Yeah. Great question. Um, Within the societies themselves, I'm not aware of that, but actually there is a group of people, I've been in conversation with some of um, a number of botanical gardens around the world, especially through Botanical Gardens International, B BGCI, have been trying to work to develop something that might look like a certification program. Because it is interesting to note, right? Like we're all familiar with say fair trade coffee, things like that. Um, could there be a way of developing a kind of social environmental certification scheme where, you know, for instance, um, Plants are coming with certifications that, you know, the that the purchasing of these plants supporting local communities that also are working to conserve them in habitat. I think I think it's a, a promising idea, um, as skeptical as sometimes I am of market responses. Um, yeah. But it's not one that currently exists. Um, and and um, but there, I know there are people who are thinking a lot about that right now. Yeah, um, I can't find the question. Oh, yeah, here it is. I'm kind of weirdly interested as well what what do you think contributes to the gender difference in men collecting cacti and is it an aesthetic reason yeah i so i spent a lot of time also interviewing um like cactus and succulent store owners as well and ask them similar questions and you know they would point out like oh yeah like nine times out of ten if it's a random guy that walks into the shop like if they have if they're just looking for a plant they're going to leave with a cactus but if it's a woman they might leave with a succulent it's really important to, like it, it, this became an important I don't want to be over deterministic about this, right? You know, and so there's nothing about the plants themselves that speaks back to our gender uh, mm -hmm. expression, right? So in the archives, for instance, I found um, there was a early cactus and succulent society in Baltimore, Maryland, for instance, at the urn of the the turn of the uh, the twentieth century, and they note, for instance, that it was women in particular who were really enamored with cacti, right? So this tells us so this is nothing that is fixed per se. But unambiguously in our culture today, I think there is something about the expression of cacti as tough and able to you know, survive in a harsh climate. They have spines, right? They look intimidating. Um, that seems to speak to a particular brand of masculinity. But what I found most fascinating in that is when you actually spent time with collectors, what they would usually tell you they cared most about it all, of all with these, th with these plants was when they flowered, right? Which we oftentimes associate with being an extremely feminine organ, right? And so it was interesting to see how people navigated this. What we did definitely find though, and I have I have quantitative data to back this up too, is it was often, it was definitely often, most often, it was definitely um, men more than women who engaged in illicit behaviors as well in terms of the illegal movement of these plants around the world as well. And that's also a dynamic that's seen in other illegal wildlife trades too. Mm. Um, that's really yeah that's an oddity but it's really interesting and it might actually be more of a symbol of how we perceive aesthetics you know like prickly large yes. things versus like soft and soft uh, and squishy and cute yeah soft Absolutely. yeah yeah um monica Vardy says uh she's a cultural anthropologist who does research on the illegal traffic of african art and mm. artifacts and is a cactus lover so Global South art, and that's in quotes, is trafficked and desired for its authenticity, defined as originally used in a ritual context. Mm 
why do cactus collectors desire specimens collected in the wild rather than cultivated? Um, is it the yeah. thrill of finding it in the wild? That's yeah, I mean, so the, the question already answers itself in a certain way, and that, 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 as I mentioned, there was that quote, some collectors want the real thing, right? So the fantasy of the real as authentic for certain collectors is insatiable, I would say. Yeah. That there's something different about the wild real thing than the cultivated thing. Now, that being said, that's not for everybody, right? So there's not, I don't want to be, again, too over-deterministic that there's only one answer. For some, it's the thrill of the chase, right? For the, the plant that's hardest to find is the plant that's most desirable. For others, it's purely aesthetic. Some collectors actually prefer plants that look like they were grown in the wild to the extent that some people who even grow cultivated plants try to make them look like they were sort of grown in the wild, which is to say weather beaten and kind of beat up and ugly. So a lot of collectors don't even want a beautiful kind of perfectly flawless plant. They want what they call a hard grown species, which can also make um, the regulation online even harder because you do have certain species that look like they were poached from the wild that might actually be cultivated by a really skilled collector who knows how to kind of work the plant to look like that. But that that point about authenticity is something that we see in the, the collection trade as well. Your whole subject is so fascinating. I mean, from uh, gender to sociology to con conservation. Um, I mean, really, my congratulations on finding um, this topic yeah. to research. And I'll end with one last question um, from Martin Newman. Is um, So there are obviously issues like this in a lot of uh, species, uh, herpetological, fish. Uh, do you feel like any part of your studies are translatable into those fields? Yeah, I, thank you for that question. I, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, I think in terms of the research, time will, you know, time will tell. But I think that um, there are a lot of parallels. So for instance, the comment about antiquity. So um, I, I included that quote from, from Donna Yates and, and her colleague, um, you know, who's an antiquities theft scholar. And so certainly I, I'm, I'm in conversation with people who, who do work on illicit trades um, in a, a other contexts. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm doing some writing projects with people who work on other things from, you know, bear bile to songbird trade to other kinds of illegal wildlife trade. Um, you know, there's always that move back and forth between specificity and context, but then also looking for generalizable patterns. And so I, I certainly hope that there are ways in which this work can translate. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that I, you know, I make the claim about the book is we need to pay attention to more than just the economy, even if the economy is important, right? These basics of supply and demand. And so I certainly hope as an intervention, right? I'm making this case for greater attention to sort of issues of unconscious import in, in, in scholarship on illegal wildlife trade. Um, and, and hopefully that's something that can be translated into other contexts too. Thank you so much. And I don't know if you got a chance to parse through the chat, but I mean, um, people loved your lecture and thank you so much for that. I can send you, so would you like to give your email to people in case they have uh, yeah, yeah, sure. um, ideas? The, do you have my email that you can put I in do, the chat? I can send it to our attendees. Yeah, I'm, happy, um, I'm happy to hear from people. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. And I'll see you at our next event, which is next week. And thank you, Jared. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the opportunity.